Welcome to another edition of Marriage for Better for Worse. Hi, I'm Pastor Bob Moeller, and I'll be your host for the next 30 minutes. Our topic for this program is marriage in the last days, in particular, the suffering marriage. Marriage in the last days before the return of Christ and the suffering marriage in particular. We'll explain that in just a moment. Please remember that I'm not a professional psychologist or psychiatrist. I am a pastor who believes that listening, caring, uh, prayer, and God's Word can solve relationship issues. Well, we're examining the book of Revelation, specifically the first three chapters of the book of Revelation, as it relates to marriage. Now, you might say, well, those, those chapters were dedicated to churches, seven churches at the time. Well, yes. But stop and consider for a moment how often the scriptures use marriage as a metaphor for Christ in the church. That uh, Christ um, in Ephesians 5 is a husband who gave himself sacrificially for his wife, that is the church, and how the church is to respect uh, and honor uh, Christ and women their husband as well. Uh, Paul says this is a great mystery when he talks about marriage, but he says, I'm talking about Christ and the church. Revelation talks about the marriage supper of the Lamb and that the church is like a bride who has readied herself coming down out of heaven. So actually, marriage and the church are two very similar concepts used almost interchangeably in Scripture. And as you think about it, churches are made up of people. And a congregation is a group of people different types of people, including married people, husbands and wives, which is our focus for this program. We're going to be looking at the second church that Jesus wrote a letter to in the book of Revelation, and that is um, the church in Smyrna. Uh, That was located in what is modern Turkey today, and Jesus had some, uh, again, he had some praise for that church, but there were some problems he pointed out. There was a prescription he offered to correct them, and there was a promise of the blessing that they could um, inherit if they would obey him. In our series, Marriage in the Last Days, that period of time that is the run-up to the return of Christ, we are looking at the seven churches of Revelation. And the title of this program, as I said, is The Suffering Marriage, or The Church in Smyrna. Well, the church in Smyrna had a uh, kind of an amazing, or the city of Smyrna had an amazing history, a storied history. For example, it was the birthplace of the epic tale of Homer and the Odyssey, uh, that famous Greek tale which uh, endures even to this day. Homer and the Odyssey uh, originated in Smyrna at that time. By the way, and this is for free, I won't charge you, Um, There are six copies left of the Odyssey in the original uh, Greek in which it was written in. Uh, Six copies. Do you know how many copies there are of the New Testament which was also written in Greek? There are over a thousand. Uh, That's one reason we can have such confidence in the inerrancy of Scripture is that it has been so carefully preserved. And the next classical piece of literature from that era has six copies. Well, that's an aside. But Homer and the Odyssey originated in Smyrna. Uh, It was also the center of emperor worship in which uh, citizens in the Roman Empire in that region of the world, uh, the Western Mediterranean, were required to declare this publicly. They had to say, Caesar is Lord. And then as an act of worship, devotion, they would have to burn incense to him with a little pinch of salt. Salt was considered to be a very valuable commodity, and this sort of sealed the idea that the emperor was a deity to which you made offerings. However, the believers in Christ in Smyrna could not bow their knee to Caesar much less worship him and declare him as Lord. Why? Because they believe Jesus Christ is Lord 
and no one else. Paul says in Philippians 2, for example, every tongue shall confess, every knee shall bow, that, and, and utter the words, Jesus Christ is Lord. Well, you can imagine the dilemma believers faced. Either I declare that I worship the emperor and I make an offering, or else I might lose my job or else my business might be boycotted or shut down, or else I might be arrested, or my family and I might be exiled. I mean, there were serious repercussions if you would not say Caesar is Lord. Well, even today, isn't this true? Trouble begins whenever you declare Jesus is Lord. <laughs> if you want to start uh, a fuss somewhere, just simply declare Jesus is Lord. Some time ago, we put uh, magnetic bumper stickers that uh, a church gave to us when we worshiped there one Sunday, which very attractive, uh, kind of an oval shape, uh, black background, uh, silver lettering that just says, white lettering that just says, Jesus is Lord. And I thought a lot about, before I put that on my car, not because I questioned whether I want people to know he's Lord of my life, but because of how I drive sometimes. <laughs> I didn't want to be a bad witness. But nonetheless, if you believe Jesus is Lord, you cannot say Caesar is Lord. Not then, not today. Smyrna was also a wicked city. Jesus says, says and he said this in his letter, that that is where Satan has his synagogue. Well, those are pretty serious words. What he means is there were a group of people at that time there who were doing the will of the evil one, even if they didn't realize it, by persecuting Christians so furiously and so ruthlessly. We've seen in our day, haven't we, how different groups around the world have persecuted believers, whether it's in North Korea, the Middle East, um, Sudan, Nigeria. Unfortunately, there's a long list. Do you know what's in common uh, in most of those situations, Iran, for example? They really believe they're doing God as they believe he exists. They believe they're doing him a favor um, by burning churches, by persecuting Christians. Um, in Nigeria, an attack recently took 160 lives of innocent people uh, by jihadists who uh, believed they were doing God a favor by persecuting Christians. That is what Jesus is referring to when he talks about a synagogue of Satan. Jesus said, however, the main problem in Smyrna, um, well, it did come from the outside. He said, I know your afflictions and your poverty. He said, um, I know how much you suffer and I know how difficult life is for you. And today your marriage may be undergoing afflictions and poverty. Maybe you have even suffered the loss of your job because you confess Jesus Christ is Lord. You see, the suffering marriage is one that in a world that is increasingly hostile to your faith, your marriage may end up very well facing financial hardships, slander, and even persecution. You can find yourself very quickly in a culture that has left God and his values on the wrong side of almost every issue. And now you are labeled and derided as some of the worst of society. Well, that's what happened to the people in Smyrna. And that's what can happen to believers as we approach the last days or if we have entered into them. Jesus offers a prescription, though, for a suffering marriage. He says this, do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. He says, don't let fear take over your life. Resist the pull to give in to fear. Endure the hardships that may come your way and remain true to Christ through all your afflictions. Well, how can we not be fearful as we look at the various ways we could be singled out or punished for our confession that Jesus Christ is Lord? Well, to begin with, we have to believe that God is in control and that whatever is happening is under his sovereign control. 
and that ultimately it will redound, it will result in his glory. That we do not need to fear because God is in control. We do not need to fear because we know our destiny. That we have a home in heaven, an eternal home. Uh, that this life is temporary and was never meant to be permanent. And regardless of what happens, we know that we shall be welcomed, even as Stephen was the martyr who was stoned, into the arms of Jesus if persecuted. Now, not all Christians will be persecuted. Uh, no one should seek persecution. Um, but rather, if it comes your way, you don't need to give in to fear. Uh, the final reason we don't need to be afraid is that we can trust the wisdom of God. Well, what is the wisdom of God? The wisdom of God is that um, whatever we are going through, uh, God has allowed because it will achieve in our life exactly the most important thing that he wanted to achieve for the most important length of time that will impact the greatest number of people. The wisdom of God is such that our circumstances can be divinely orchestrated. It doesn't make him the author of persecution or of evil, but it means that he will use this in our lives to achieve something of eternal value and weight. So, just the fact you are suffering as you are for your devotion to Christ is a sure sign that God trusts you. God would not allow you to go through this if he didn't trust you. He knows that in one way or the other you will emerge when this um, trial is over, refined, purified, uh, like gold, like silver, that these afflictions will only burn away the dross in our life. The key word here is courage, and courage is showing grace under pressure, isn't it? It's not an absence of fear, it's a commitment to do the right thing even in the face of fear. The remedy for the suffering marriage is to pray for and demonstrate courage in the midst of all your afflictions. And here's the promise Christ makes to the suffering marriage in uh, Revelation 2, 10 through 11. I will give you the crown of life and you will not be hurt at all by the second death. In other words, as you remain courageous in your faith, you will be honored in a special way at Christ's return. Because you are saved by placing your faith in the finished work of the cross, you also have no reason to fear the second death or eternal punishment. We will all undergo death for the first time, a natural death, unless uh, we are taken to heaven in the rapture and he returns. Uh, very few people in the Bible ever escaped death. Uh, Enoch was one of them. He walked with God and God took him. Elijah was another that was caught up, uh, raptured, if you will, in a chariot. Um, very few have escaped death in that regard. But the second death is not um, the phys our physical death. It's where we are uh, judged and thrown into eternal torment and fire, the place the Bible describes as Gehenna or hell. That is the second death. And it says, um, you will not be hurt at all by the second death as uh, you have been redeemed for all eternity by me. So remain courageous in your faith. You'll be honored at Christ's uh, return. In summary, let me ask some questions to see if your marriage might qualify today as a suffering marriage. And I'll just put these questions out there. You can answer them for yourselves. Have you paid a dear price to remain faithful to Christ at your job or in your extended family? or perhaps even in your local church? Have other afflictions entered your life? Have you had to face too much sorrow in your marriage in too short a period of time? Is life continually coming at you with all its problems relentlessly? Do you finish one crisis only to face another? Do you feel some days like just giving up? Remember this. If you are suffering because of your devotion to Christ and to one another in your marriage, it is a sure sign that God trusts you. The circumstances you face are the result of the wisdom of God. And one day all your afflictions and poverty will be rewarded by Christ when he returns. As Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 4, 17-18, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us 
an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Well, let's look at some more questions that apply to the suffering marriage. In the last year, we have faced numerous financial setbacks, including the breakdown several times of our vehicles, many health crises that required out-of-pocket expenditures, even after insurance, and traveling back and forth to take care of family members, which has been unexpected expenses. Is this just bad luck or is this spiritual warfare? How can we tell the difference? Well, in this world, we will have tribulation and everybody has problems. Uh, no one is immune. So I can't say with certainty that your problems are a spiritual attack. Unless you know that recently you have been growing in Christ in significant ways. Or you know that Jesus has been using your marriage or the two of you to impact others in profound ways. Or if it's apparent that some ministry or ministry opportunity is coming to fruition that could have a tremendous impact for the kingdom of God. When we can say yes to those things, it's fairly easy to predict that there's going to be spiritual opposition. And sometimes that takes the form of just calamities, one after another after another. And that is, as one pastor told me, uh, you only get flack if you're over the target. What he meant by that was, uh, during World War II, the anti-aircraft guns only unloaded when uh, the planes, Allied planes, were directly over the target they were about to destroy. Otherwise, they could be left alone in many, for much of the journey. Well, if you are over the target, so to speak, and God is using your marriage and your life in significant ways to bring people to Christ, to spread his gospel, to... Um, share his love in ways that's transformational. Don't be surprised if your tires go flat, your refrigerator quits working, you get some kind of health diagnosis that you have to uh, be concerned about. I believe often when we know that we are in a mode of cl a close walk with Christ and fruit is occurring, yeah, trouble is gonna happen and we are going to have to face things. A friend of ours works at a bank where he is required to attend events that celebrate, among other things, Gay Pride Month. When he asked permission to be exempted on religious grounds, he was told if he did not participate, it might cost him his job. He has a family to support and losing his job would create tremendous hardships. What should he do? Well, there again, uh, the words of Christ to Smyrna, are very important. He said, don't be afraid of what you're about to suffer for my name. What he was saying was that I'll take care of you. I'll um, honor your faithfulness. I will provide for you. Uh, even if it means the loss of a job or an income or the certainty of retirement or any other benefits that you've enjoyed. Again, you don't go looking for this kind of trouble. But if people ask you uh, to participate in something that you feel is against Scripture and is against the Word of God, that is the behavior of uh, people, their sexual behavior that is outside of God's plan, you have to believe that um, Jesus will take care of you and that there are more important things in life than keeping a job. There are more important things than being certain um, you'll, be, uh, you'll be financially secure in the years to come. Uh, can I say one additional word um, on that particular question? Every believer should have a deep, sincere love and spiritual concern for those that find themselves in the LGBTQ community. And that love means that we care very much for them as individuals and very much want them to know Jesus Christ as their Lord. We do not hate them. We have no desire to persecute anyone. We simply cannot agree with behavior that Scripture uh, does not allow. So it is possible. I know that many um, on the other side of this issue say, 
if you hate the behavior, you hate the person, but really that's a ridiculous type of argument. Uh, when I was raising our children at home, even if I hated their behavior, not for a moment did I hate any one of them. And my opposition to their behavior was actually based on my love for them, not any type of animosity. Romans 13 teaches us we are to obey the governing authorities. Wasn't the church in Smyrna disobeying the authorities by refusing to confess Caesar is Lord and pinch that little salt? Well, indeed, we are to obey the authorities. Um, if I haven't read this in a while, I need to re uh, read it again because these words apply to us as Christians. In Romans 13, and Paul, remember, was uh, often a prisoner of this brutal Roman Empire and these emperors that um, went too far. Everyone, the Bible says, must submit himself to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, he who rebels against the authorities is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those, who do what, for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right. He will commend you. For he is God's servant to do you good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword for nothing. He is God's servant and agent of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also because of conscience. This is also why you pay taxes, for the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to governing. Give everyone what is owe him. If you owe him taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. But you notice on that list, it does not say, if you owe them worship, then offer them worship. We offer worship to no one except Christ himself. He and he alone is Lord. Yes, in the book of Acts, when the Jewish authorities told them to stop preaching the name of Christ in the synagogue, they said, you tell us what is right, whether to obey God or whether to obey man. So, Jesus promised the church at Smyrna if they remained faithful, they would receive the crown of life. Aren't all Christians promised a crown when they reach heaven? This sounds almost like works righteousness. Is salvation by grace through faith alone or not? Well, the crown of life can mean two different things. One, it can just mean that it is now the fulfillment of eternal life that began on earth, that heaven is the crown, if you will, of that promise. And when they get there, um, they will be rewarded for their faithfulness, for their trusting Christ as Savior and their faithful living. And so it may mean just the fulfillment of uh, the promise of eternal life, or it may mean a special reward. I honestly believe that those who have suffered for Christ, say um, at the hands of ISIS or others, some who literally lost their lives as martyrs to the cruelty of groups uh, such as them, I believe that uh, their faithfulness to Christ, even in terms of paying the ultimate price, um, they will be rewarded in a special way that those of us who have not had to sacrifice our lives will not be rewarded. Um, so yes, there is a special crown or a special reward. I don't know exactly what that looks like, but I think we can trust Christ in his word. What about people who sometimes buckle under the weight of persecution, uh, such as in hostile Middle Eastern nations, North Korea, do they lose their salvation if under extreme pressure they renounce their faith or compromise it to appease their persecutors? That was a question that troubled the church for many years after Rome quit persecuting Christians. When Rome became the, a Christian empire, if you will, at least when Constantine declared it to be so in the year, I believe, uh, 312 AD or thereabouts, what did you do with those people who buckled under persecution to save their own lives? Well, there were some who argued that they should never be allowed back in the church and that they had been apostates and could never be forgiven. But then there were others who said, no, 
um, if they repent of what they did, if they realize that it was wrong and uh, confess it as such and seek restitution with the church, that they should be uh, forgiven and that they should be allowed back in the church uh, as members. Great, you can imagine the controversy that must have raged about that. But I think at the end of the day, we have to remember that when any of us as believers turn away from our sin, if we were believers to begin with, no matter how grievous it may have become, if we sincerely repent and acknowledge that and um, remorse, uh, repent, uh, seek to make restitution, those things don't save us, but I believe that they are indicators we always were saved. And I believe that God can forgive those who failed uh, under pressure, who failed under fire, if you will. Um, the only thing that will keep us from heaven is if we've never trusted Christ as our Savior. Um, now, the Bible does say no one can say Jesus be cursed except by um, the influence of the, the devil. And so perhaps some people who do say that were never saved in the first place. And we can't say Jesus is Lord except by the help of the Holy Spirit. Anyway, it's a topic of much debate and consideration. Well, what does Jesus mean um, when he says that um, it was a synagogue of Satan? Uh, well, again, I answered that earlier in the program. It just meant that religious people were using religion in a way that was not as God intended it. It did not honor him but instead it was being used to make life hard, difficult, if not impossible, for true believers. It wasn't referring to just one group of um, those who don't trust Christ. I think it, it, it gathers in all of those people who uh, might feel that they are very religious, but in the end of the day, their actions belie them. Well, I hope you're enjoying this series on marriage in the last days. As we look at the intense pressure that may be brought to bear on marriages as we possibly approach, not with certainty, but with possibly approach, the events that will usher in the final return of Christ. We hope you'll join us next time. Remember, marriage is for better, for worse, and for keeps.